let's go on to talk about limits of random variables. So the question at hand is, what happens to the sum of random variables x1, x2 up to xn as the number of random variables n increases? Okay, so the answer is gonna depend, as we'll see, on how we normalize the sum. So for instance, let's say that the x1 through xn our IID, which is the assumption we're going to take through this whole video, that our intuition should tell us that the average or sample mean 1 over n sum of xi should approach the true mean e of x as n increases. And that's true, but 1 over root n times the sum will actually behave more like a Gaussian random variable with mean e of x. We'll see why that's true um, in this video and we'll try to make this a bit more precise. One formal addition we need to our framework is that an infinite sequence of random variables, which is really what we're dealing with, is specified by a collection of joint CDFs, which are joint PMFs um, in the discrete case, and they lead to joint PDFs in the continuous case. Well, we're gonna have a collection for every possible finite subset of random variables. So any collection of random variables you pick up, they have a joint PMF, and or joint PDF. We're just going to assume that's true. That's the one thing we need to talk about infinite sequences, and you really don't need to worry about it. I just need to say this to make the framework all come together. Okay, and we're going to focus on IID sequences of random variables, meaning that any possible subset of random variables that you pick up um, is itself IID. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about the weak law of large numbers. So let mn be the sample mean, okay? So it's the average of an IID sequence of random variables, and n here is going to increase, okay? So we're gonna be taking averages of more and more data, and there's a mean which we're gonna call mu, and we're gonna assume it's finite. So the weak law of large numbers says for any choice of epsilon greater than zero, then the probability that the sample mean minus the true mean is greater than epsilon, that goes to zero. So this probability of deviating from the true mean by more than epsilon, for any choice of epsilon you like, that will eventually go to zero. Okay, so intuitively, I'll just say one more time, for any tolerance epsilon that you choose, the sample mean will eventually land in the interval mu minus epsilon or to mu plus epsilon with high probability. So how fast does this happen? To say something about this, we need a little bit more in terms of additional assumptions. So the simplest thing we could say is that the variance is also finite. Then we could say that this goes down like the variance over n times epsilon squared. So basically it vanishes like one over n, which seems nice, but it actually is pretty slow in the grand scheme of things. And usually if we impose a little bit more in terms of additional assumptions, we can get a faster convergence. So if we assume the random variables are bounded between A and B, then we can say that this goes down exponentially fast. Okay, so here's how it goes down exponentially fast. Or we could say that the random variables are Gaussian with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared. Then we can also say it goes down exponentially fast. Okay, and what about going exactly to the true mean? Well, it turns out that's also true. That's the strong law of the large numbers. So if you take the limit of the sample mean and ask when it's equal to the true mean, it turns out that as n goes to infinity, it's always equal to the true mean, okay? And intuitively, all that's telling us is just as we expect, eventually the sample mean converges exactly to the true mean, okay? And in case you're wondering what the difference is really between this weak law and the strong law, the strong law is telling you that at the very end of this infinite sequence, you'll hit the true mean exactly. The weak law is saying that along the way, you can get a sense of how quickly you're converging to that exact answer by setting up an interval and asking what's the probability that you leave that interval. And that's what I've worked out with these assumptions. Another thing that you see with sequences of random variables is the central limit theorem. And what it says is that for an IID sequence with finite means and finite variances, let's look at the sum of these random variables. Then the CDF of this object, which is the sum, 
minus the mean of the sum, which is n times mu, divided by the standard deviation of the sum, which is sigma times root n, that converges to the standard normal CDF for any value of y. So if you look at the limit of the CDF of this thing, it becomes phi of y, which is the CDF for Gaussian 0, 1. Okay, that's a long statement. The intuition is that 1 over root n times the sum of the random variables looks Gaussian for large n, and basically the sum of many small independent effects looks Gaussian eventually. Okay, so let's just look at this visually to see what I mean. Here in this example, I have x1, x2, and so on, which are id Bernoulli 1 half, yn is defined as above, and what I'm doing is plotting what happens to the CDF. So you can see that for n equals 10, I kind of have this staircase representing the CDF of this discrete um, random variable, which is the sum of 10 Bernoullis, and I have this red curve, which is the Gaussian CDF. As I go up to 25 Bernoulli summed together, the staircase is kind of getting um, narrower and it's converging more to this Gaussian CDF. And at n equals 100, I still kind of see that staircase structure, but it's getting even closer to that Gaussian CDF and eventually um, it's gonna converge perfectly. Okay, so um, all it's saying is that if you add up a lot of things, which are independent, and you normalize it correctly, you'll get a Gaussian CDF. And this is a lot more general that I've written here. So you can relax some of these assumptions. You could allow for, you know, different means and variances. You could allow for weak dependence between some of the random variables. As long as you normalize and account for those effects properly, you can still get a central limit theorem. Although all of those uh, extensions I mentioned are beyond our scope. What we will need is that the central limit theorem is often used as a justification for why it is okay to approximate the distribution of a sum, which we argued is kind of complicated to work out, as just a Gaussian. Okay, so as an example, let's say I have x1 through xn, and those are iid random variables, and I have their mean, and I have their variance, so their mean is mu and their variance is sigma squared, and I work out the sample mean, Okay, and I want to use the central limit theorem justification to approximate some quantities. Okay, and we're going to see these quantities in the later video, so we really want to know these answers. So what's the probability that the sample mean is less than or equal to some value c? Okay, well we know the sample mean has mean mu, and it has variance sigma squared over n. We saw that in the previous video. So what we're going to do is just say, well, by the central limit theorem, we know that eventually this thing is going to look pretty Gaussian. So I'm just going to say it's Gaussian with mean mu and variance sigma squared over n. That's my approximation. So then here, what I'm interested in, probably then less than or equal to some value. That's just my CDF plugging in C. And that I approximate using the Gaussian CDF, right? So I just get C minus mu over standard deviation, okay? What about this quantity that we saw um, before? So the probability that the sample mean minus mu is greater than epsilon. So this is something that's gonna come up for us quite a bit. So let's see how to approximate that using a Gaussian. Well, we can talk about the left tail. So that's the probability that I'm less than mu minus epsilon and the right tail, which is the probability I'm greater than mu plus epsilon. So if you calculate the probabilities of these two events, that ends up being the probability that I have on the left here, okay? So by the Gaussian approximation, this part I just approximate by the uh, Gaussian CDF of mu minus epsilon minus mu over standard deviation plus one minus the same thing basically because I'm looking at greater than instead of less than. And I'm gonna simplify these by canceling the mu's, okay? And moving the root up to the numerator, right? So I get these two expressions. And it turns out, if you go back to our original video about Gaussian random variables, that we can talk about the standard normal complementary CDF, which we call Q of Z, that's equal to phi of minus Z. And by symmetry, it's also equal to one minus phi of Z. And so these two terms are actually just two Q epsilon root N over sigma. And this specific value here is gonna be really useful for us because we're gonna use it to develop confidence intervals and um, 
bounds for significance testing. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to assume that in the regime that we've collected this data, we're pretty sure that the Gaussian distribution does a good job of approximating what we're seeing. And then we can just use this as an approximation uh, for those quantities.